Hey gang, it's KR King of D&D Homebrew talking today about avoiding boring encounters and I'm going to use a classic, you know, boring monster, the zombie for my example. First of all, some of you may think zombies are super exciting, but you know, when you start playing D&D, they are such an iconic monster and you have them with low level parties and they stumble forth and the guys wipe them out and clerics get higher. They just turn them away or dispel them at later levels. They, they seem kind of like, okay, they're old hat. But I think one of the things, if you just go by the monster manual and just use that, uh, you know, the stats there, that can create boring encounters with zombies when, in fact, they have a rich history in, uh, you know, culture and in literature and films. A zombie apocalypse is a worldwide cultural phenom in films and TV shows and books. And so what you want to do if you want to make your zombie uh, encounters and situations and storylines more interesting is to incorporate some of the ideas that you get from history and from media. Because historically, uh, zombies come from voodoo uh, in places like Haiti and Brazil. Uh, the voodoo practitioner could take a recently dead person with voodoo rites and they would rise from the grave and then they would be uh, serve this master, do whatever he wanted, and they were sort of near dead, right? And this went on until the modern concept, which is George Romero's Night of the Living Dead, where he came up with the concept of he had ghouls, ghouls eat the dead, but they became zombies because of the way he had them shuffle, which was for uh, budgetary considerations. It's an interesting story if you ever want to look up Night of the Living Dead. And they had this ravenous hunger being ghouls, but they were associated with zombies, and this is why we associate zombies having this ravenous hunger, whereas a zombie under the control of a voodoo priest wouldn't necessarily, they just, they're dead, they just walk around until he decides to dispel them. Now, what's interesting is the necromatic zombies of D&D are much more like the original, right? The guy rises up a corpse, the necromancer, and they're under his control, and he can control a certain number at once. If you look at the way the spell works, he can compound this every 24 hours, have, you know, a zombie army, as it were. Now, the most obvious way to change this is just change the stats. Now, you'll notice in the Monster Manual, they have an ogre zombie, which basically has the same stats, except for movement rate, of a living ogre. And then they show you the zombie beholder in there, which is a real much more powerful creature, you know, and it does have zombie features. It randomly does its eye stalks and this sort of thing. And the idea here is you can have any kind of monster that you choose as a zombie. Now, what this infers is not necessarily that it was animated, but there was some kind of curse or something happened to it. This is a more along the lines of the George Romero infection thing that we see in place like 28 days you know the walking dead this sort of thing it's a virus it's some you know that all the george romero and uh type zombies are scientific right they're not some magical thing like the voodoo so let's just look at the standard zombie though the, the humanoid zombie plus three to hit 1d6 plus one they also have this thing if they go down they can make a dc save and come back up to one if they go below zero but there's and they move 20 feet and they just stumble along they're kind of mindless or whatever right attack whatever is in sight. How do you make that more interesting? Well, you can tweak the stats. You can, uh, you know, make them, uh, if they're bigger, they strike for more damage. Maybe they wield a weapon. Maybe they have a dim memory of something, right? Now, the intelligent zombie is something, there's a famous short story when uh, she falls, he catches her by Eugenie Foster, where this, I don't want to spoil the story, but with this these zombies have sort of this mental memory of what happened that they reenact. You also have uh, things like there's a great short story, Empire of the Necromancers by Clark Ashton Smith. Really good where these necromancers animate all the other like skeletons, but they're basically like the necromatic animation we have in D&D. And there's a spark of intelligence in there. So you could have zombies that for some reason have some intelligence or are very intelligent, however you want to play it, right? And they may scheme... They may want something, some way to get their, you know, their, to die, let's say. The living death is, you know, undead status is no good. They have to, you know, absolve themselves of some curse or something like this so that you have a zombie village. There is a um, In the Flesh, this British TV show about a zombie plague, and they figure out how to cure it, and they can keep the zombies still alive. It's about these teenage zombies in the school. And they're still dead. Their skin is pale. It wasn't a successful thing because I think people really like the ravaging zombies. Um, but the intelligence, uh, the speed factor. You have in 28 days, the rapid zombies that move really fast. What if you had zombies that operated like quicklings, right? Where they have, they're so fast and they're so rapid, they have advantage on their attacks. 
Quicklings have this thing where they can attack you and then do a disengage and go move 100 feet away. Uh, zombies seem to want to attack, but again, because, again, they want to bite you and whatever. But still that advantage and then other things with that tremendous speed, you can't get away from them. What if they can move, you know, 80 a turn or something instead of you know, 20? You know, again, you see zombies and they're coming at you. They're going to catch up to you. Now, another thing is their immunities because zombies immune to poison and they're undead. So they, the sleep spells can't affect them or charms and things like that. But obviously area effect spells are always very effective. What if they're, you know, immune to fire damage? Because again, what made them zombies? Some catastrophe, some, you know, uh, magical experiment that went wrong and they're based in fire and actually fire, not only does it not hurt them, but it makes them stronger, right? You can do anything you want. When your idea is to make them more interesting. There's a storyline to where these zombies came from, something to do with fire. You can also have what they call crawler zombies, like a hands that crawl like this and their claws are infected. Now, typically, again, these things just crawl along the ground like in something like The Walking Dead. But what if they're super fast? What if they sneak around, they hide in trees, and they come down on you, these undead hands, and claw you? And, you know, poison, you know, plague, you know, whatever, such that you have to get, a you know, in the 5e world, a restoration or greater or something, you know, uh, in the older versions, um, uh, cure disease. And the other thing is, if you look at the older versions, there were 3D8 zombies appear in the book. And this brings up numbers, because one of the things about this is, you know, if you have 10 zombies or 15 zombies, again, it's 83d8 in that, that book. What if you had a village, the players go, it's totally abandoned. And there was a plague and the few villagers that left just, you know, locked up and left, right? And as some curse, they stole some treasure and the players go in and find this thing and activate the zombies. And let's say 100 zombies 200, 300, you know, it's like the, the movie, the, the fog, where the guys from the ship come out of the fog, but they would just rise up and you got 300 zombies all around the players, standard zombies, but they got numbers. And the thing is, you can blast so many. Now, again, if they move 20 feet, then it's not so deadly. So you got to think about that. Or it would it be deadly. I mean, you just play this out because if they surround the players and, you know, they're attacking with all their little attacks, suddenly it's a much different encounter. You know, there's different films and things. I saw one where they had pukers, zombies that blah, went out this thing and it caused a certain amount of acid damage when it hits you, also the disease. I saw another thing where there were zombies that when you kill them, they explode and send stuff in. Again, the poison, the disease, the contagion. Uh, I saw this thing where there's a zombie that all you do is touch them and they explode, right? And when the players run into this, again, it's not your standard zombie. Oh, here we go. Whatever. Uh, again, zombies, uh, there's one that uh, the zombies are partly mechanized, they're sort of clockwork, half humanoid, half zombies. Again, you might want to have a storyline as to some mad scientist created these. But in each of these cases, you're taking the standard zombie and you're thinking about what do I change in terms of their stats, right? In terms of their the movement rate. Uh, the hit points, the attack points, and not just saying, oh, well, I'm going to make a, you know, a zombie bugbear and that'll have that corresponding thing, which is fine. But you're taking the standard humanoid and you're giving them special abilities. And again, with the mystery thing that I've talked about many times, you don't have to necessarily explain it. You don't necessarily have to get a, a storyline behind it. But what you're doing is you're making it interesting. Now, it's best to have some kind of storyline as to why are there clockwork zombie things, half man, half machine or whatever. Why are they puking out this, you know, deadly spray? Why are these little hand things coming? Why do they move so quickly, right? What was it that caused them to become zombies such that they have these abilities? But the thing is, you don't have to. Your goal is to look at those, those stats, look at the uh, storyline, the mythos of zombies, because your goal here is to make it more interesting. And how you can do that is to give it a, abilities like that. And the other thing, when you create a storyline of zombies, they might have more resistances than just poison. Because a zombie that's not affected by fire or takes energy from the fire is more interesting than just your standard zombie, right? It has a new wrinkle to it, right? The players, you know, think about area effect spells or think about zombies that the curse that made them zombies makes them much harder to turn or dispel. You must be a higher level cleric. They are turned like a vampire. I don't know, something like that, where suddenly that ability, and it isn't just about 
you know, oh, they're harder to kill. It's about, well, what, what was this? What made this happen? Maybe it's just the leaders. And again, this is intelligence. You're combining different ideas here to make zombies more interesting. Because the other thing about having the intelligent ones or semi-intelligence, they can use tactics. They're not just, you know, that kind of thing. But they're actually thinking about what they're going to do. But they're still the undead. They still have been animated perhaps by some necromancer or perhaps by some plague. And that story creates a zombie that's different. Because what your players want is they get to a certain point and they don't ever want to run into zombies again, right? But they have to go to this village to get this artifact and it activates 300 zombies. It's at least a more interesting battle than 10, right? It's something that well, this is a real threat to these higher level players. Or they can't just turn and dispel it because the curse that they're working to get rid of is part of this thing that's zombifying all these humanoids in this area. And that's what makes homebrewing your world so cool because you're coming up with a storyline, this great curse or this contagion, this magical experiment that went wrong, caused these zombies. And since it's unique to your world, it's not out of the monster manual, right? Which, and again, the monster manual is just a guide. You can do anything you want, but you've got an explanation here because you're homebrewing something where there is this effect that's creating undead zombies, but they're your zombies. They're unique. They have these resistances. You know, they have extra attacks. You know, their attacks do, you know, explosion, <laughs> vomit, or something where they can, you know, shoot off their nails. You know, again, you can just be as creative as you want because you're making this up and you're saying to the players, this in this world, my homebrewed world, it's, you know, it's going to be things you don't expect. It ties into something that created these, these zombies, this undead, but it's my own you know, invention, and you are the only ones that have ever run into it. And again, you may say, you know what, afterwards, oh, I did the exploding zombies, and it was kind of it was too much for the group, or they couldn't turn them, or whatever. You know, you, you're going to be accept the fact that you might have some you know, screw-ups there, or still they were boring zombies, right? I didn't do enough. But it's that process of doing this, because you're learning you know, all the time as a GM, when you're doing something like this, it isn't just, well, here's the stats in the book and I got to use them, whatever. Quickling zombies are going to be really interesting tactically. You know, how do you defeat them? So hopefully that'll make your uh, encounters, if you do some up with your players with zombies, where it's like, oh, zombies, and suddenly they're like, that was really cool. And if you like what you've seen on my channel, please subscribe. I'm always looking for more. Uh, leave me some comments. Love to hear what you've done, if you've done anything with zombies in your world. And most importantly, keep playing an RPG role-playing game and tell somebody else about it.